Okay, folks, I think we're uh, pretty much ready to get started. Um, go ahead and... Uh, all right, first off, I want to... Uh, uh, we didn't do a hacker court last year, uh, but we did it uh, the year before and uh, a couple years before that as well. So we're um, uh, kind of an evolving uh, cast of uh, characters here. I want to kind of run through everyone. Uh, and as I refer to you, wave your hand at the crowd or something so they know who you are. Uh, our judge tonight is uh, Richard Salgado. He's a... Uh, He's a, 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 a former, uh, a former uh, DOJ employee, and uh, can I mention your current employer? Okay, he cur currently works at Yahoo as their legal counsel. Discovered that you can go into the private sector and make 30, 40 times what you uh, used to make. <laughs> 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 um, our uh, court clerk is uh, Caitlin Klein. Who holds the record as being the youngest uh, speaker ever at a black hat several years ago. She was in here at uh, eight years old. So uh, a distinct uh, uh, thing there. Uh, playing uh, our uh, Samantha Jones, who's going to be a CISO of a, a company that will become clear, is uh, uh, Carol Fenley, who's back there. And this is more or less Carol's baby, okay? She's the one that's kind of come up with this whole thing. and it's. Illegitimate baby, yes, but uh, nonetheless a, a baby uh, for, for her. Uh, uh, next we have uh, uh, Kevin Bankston over here. He's a staff attorney, Electronic Frontier Foundation. Ironically, our uh, illustrious uh, EFF representative is going to be a prosecutor uh, this time, which should be, uh, should be kind of fun. Uh, next to him is our defense attorney, uh, Paul Ohm. And what's fun about Paul is he's being a defense attorney when he actually used to be DOJ and prosecute some of the scum that he'll be defending. So that's uh, got kind of nice. Uh, back for a return appearance as a defendant uh, is uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Brian Martin. Uh, he'll be representing scum tonight. Uh, we have... Uh, Brian Boulat, who is our reporter that breaks open this uh, illustrious thing. There's Ryan there. Um, where's Ovi? Ovi Carroll is uh, one of our, uh, uh, he's our uh, case agent and actually does his, uh, does his thing. Uh, <laughs> kicks in the door and all that other kind of stuff. He has lots of fun doing that. Uh, I'll be playing uh, uh, the uh, senator tonight, uh, so that's why I'm dressed this way. And then, uh, and then uh, uh, John Klein is going to be our uh, expert witnesses over here, who's uh, a lot of a uh, lot of uh, John Klein fans in the room. That's uh, it's always good. Sad, really, but there you go. Uh, let's jump onto the next slide, just to give you, uh, and we're going to try to move quickly through this. Uh, we're going to, uh, this is roughly the, uh, the order of uh, appearance that we're going to be adhering to. This is a double session, okay? Now we will be taking a break so you can run out the beginning of the gala and get liquored up and then run back in here. Now one thing we will ask is that if you're able to get two things to drink and bring us <laughs> one of them, that's even better. Or three, whatever it takes, okay? <laughs> All right, we certainly would appreciate it since it will be uh, one of those uh, open bar things. So I think uh, that's uh, pretty much uh, it with the intro, and let's go ahead and call things to get things going. All rise, Hacker Court is now in session. The Honorable Richard Salgado presiding. Thank you. <laughs> You may be seated. Uh, good afternoon, counsel. Uh, I see that the jury has been impaneled uh, and is now sitting. Uh, before we get more formally, let me just say that I want to thank the jury for taking the time to participate uh, in one of the most fundamental uh, 
ways that you can as a citizen to <clears throat> help support a rule of law in a society like ours. Uh, we have a long and illustrious history in this country of jury service, uh, and I want to express my gratitude to you for sitting here today. Uh, let me first explain how the trial is going to proceed generally. The, this is a criminal case. Uh, the United States government has brought charges against a defendant, and you're going to be hearing the case about those charges. The government, or I'll refer to them as prosecution at times, uh, is represented by a United States uh, assistant United States attorney, Kevin Bankston. He's representing the government in bringing the charges, and he will bear the burden of proof on the claims made against the defendant. The defendant here, Mr. Brian Martin, is being represented by an attorney, uh, Paul Ohm. And Mr. Ohm will be speaking on behalf of Mr. Martin, and should he choose to, will be providing a defense for his counsel, for his uh, uh, client. The indictment here charges that the defendant illegally intercepted electronic communications, otherwise known as wiretapping, and then using those communications and disclosing the communications to others, all in violation of United States federal law. The indictment is simply a document that lists the charges. It's nothing else. It's not evidence. It doesn't prove or disprove anything. It's just a listing of the charges. The defendant has pleaded not guilty to the charges listed in the indictment, and he is presumed to be innocent unless he's proven otherwise. And in fact, the jury, all 12 of you, must unanimously find that the government has proved his guilt beyond reasonable doubt before you can convict the defendant of any of the charges. The first step in this trial will be opening statements. Uh, the government opening statement will tell you about the evidence which it pretends, which it will uh, intend to put before you. And as I mentioned before, the indictment is not evidence. Well, the opening statements of the prosecutor is not also uh, in any way probative of what actually happened. They are purely descriptions of what's likely to be proved at trial or what the uh, prosecution intends to prove at trial, and nothing more than that. The defense counsel, after the uh, opening statement of the prosecution, will likewise have a, an obligation, or excuse me, an opportunity, but no obligation to present his opening statement. And again, just like the indictment and the prosecutor's opening statement, it's not evidence of anything. Uh, the evidence will come next after the opening statements, and those, uh, the evidence will be presented to you in a couple different forms. You will be hearing from witnesses through testimony. You'll be seeing documents. Uh, and there may be other types of evidence that are brought to your attention. The attorneys will bring them in, and as they come in, you will be allowed to see it, and you will hear likely testimony about uh, the document exhibits. Once the government has presented its case, the defense will have an opportunity to present its evidence. The defense has no obligation to present any evidence, uh, but may choose to do so if it wishes. After you've heard the evidence on both sides, the government and the defense will each be given time to present final arguments, closing arguments. Once those are given, I will be uh, providing you with guidance, jury instructions as it's called, on how to uh, evaluate the facts and come to a conclusion. You will be bound to follow those instructions, although the duty of actually finding the facts is exclusively within your domain. And with that introduction of what the proceeding will look like, we'll now begin with opening statements. Mr. Bankston, would you like to proceed? Yes, thank you, Your Honor. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen of this uh, untraditionally large jury. <laughs> Unfortunately, many communications providers these days have the idea that if it's my network, I can do whatever I like with the communications that I transmit. But they're dead wrong. Federal law makes it a felony to intercept private communications without the consent of the parties to those communications. Uh, and that applies to communications providers just as it applies to the general public. Not counting some narrow exceptions for interceptions that are a necessary part of uh, maintaining and securing one's network. Put simply, no sysadmin is above the law. And if they're sniffing content, they better have a damn good reason. Now, pardon my French here, but the severity of this crime, the interception of a U.S. Senator's private communications, has my prosecutorial blood boiling a bit. 
Um, today, you'll hear the story of a sysadmin Min who broke the law, who, without the consent of any party, intercepted and used and disclosed in, in violation of federal law the private emails of his users, and in particular, some very revealing emails sent by one Senator Damon Gazum. You'll hear from Senator Gazum uh, that while attending a conference of his political allies, the Coalition for Moral Order, he sent two rather blue emails with compromising photographs to his young Senate staffer, Kimberly Lovelace. Neither he nor she ever disclosed those emails or photos to anyone else, and yet they appeared in the newspaper, the Washington Compost, uh, only a few days after being sent. Now, you'll hear testimony from O.V. Carroll, the special agent of the Office of Special Investigations, about his investigation into the leak of these photos, how, after several dead ends, he finally examined the network that the coalition sysadmin, the defendant, Brian Martin, had set up for the conference that Senator Gasm attended. You'll hear what he discovered in that system, a system to which only the defendant had administrative access. There he discovered sophisticated spying software that sniffed the, the content of all of the conference attendees' internet communications, uh, and in many cases, stored those communications, including the senators, based on a filter of the defendant's own design. You'll further hear how no one but the defendant had access to those communications. Finally, you'll hear from Ryan Bulette, Bulette uh, the reporter who published the story and about his previous relationship with the defendant. Again, the only person uh, known to have access to Senator Gasm's emails and pictures uh, other than the lovely Miss Lovelace. Um, uh, these are photos of a man, uh, Senator Gasm, that the defendant once held in high esteem for his moral purity, um, but has now been disillusioned by the horrifying photographic evidence that you will soon see. Uh, taken together, this evidence paints a simple picture that the defendant unjustifiably invaded the privacy of his users without their knowledge or their consent, and in particular intercepted Senator Gasm's emails. Then, enraged by the senator's moral failings, as demonstrated by these aforementioned horrific photos, um, used them to embarrass the senator and unmask his hypocrisy by leaking them to his friend at the Washington Compost. Um, in sum, this is one sysadmin who considered himself above the law, rifling through the private communications of his users for his own devious purposes. In doing so, he has, as the evidence will show, violated federal law by intercepting, using, and disclosing Senator Gasm's personal emails. Thank you. Mr. Rome, do you have an opening statement? I do, Your Honor. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. As you probably have already gathered from that recitation, this is not your ordinary case. This is an odd case. It's an odd case with some odd people in it. Why are we here today? We are here today because an admittedly very powerful man, Senator Gasm, did something that was very embarrassing. Did something that brought, perhaps you could even say, some shame upon him, some notoriety. I'm sure many of you in the jury have heard about these facts before today. This is a powerful man who deeply embarrassed helped move the lumbering, slow machinery of the United States government to find a scapegoat, and a scapegoat they found. And that person was my client, Mr. Brian Martin. Who is Brian Martin? You will learn in the testimony that he's a young man dedicated to doing a good job running a computer network. No matter what the government may suggest, he was no lone wolf in his endeavors. His boss, his boss's boss, the, organi the organization for which he works, told him early on in his employment that it was his job to monitor his network. And this particular organization wanted him to monitor it in order to root out what they saw as the evil of pornography, and he did it, and he did it well. And so what we're really left to talk about today, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, is who owns your network? Is your network something that you are allowed to run and monitor according to your wishes that are consistent with what your organization wants. And I'm not talking about 
rogue things where you're trying to root out people having affairs. No, we're talking about if something fundamentally offends your values and your value system, what are you allowed to do with your network? And that's the question. The government has one answer. The defense will present its own answer. It's up to you as the jurors when you get your charge from the judge to decide the answer to that question. The other thing I want to focus on is you saw in the indictment that was presented earlier that there are three charges in this case. My client, Brian Martin, is accused of intercepting communications of the senator and then using and disclosing them. And I want you to keep those three things distinct in your mind the entire trial. The judge will tell you at the end what they mean, but every time the government puts up a witness, ask yourself, does this go to interception, does this go to use, or does this go to disclosure? More to the point, who gave the reporter, Ryan Bulat, these photos? Uh, I think I'm going to come back to you during closing argument and make a pitch that it just hasn't been proven. You are also going to meet people of strong values, people you may disagree with, but this isn't about values. This isn't about uh, whether or not you like or dislike the agenda of the person that's on the stand. It's a fundamental question. Who owns the network? Who owns your property? Who can protect your rights? Where are those limits? It's likely at the end of this case, you are going to find that the government and the defense agree more than they disagree about the facts. Pay close attention to where we disagree. Thank you for your service. When you hear the charge for the judge, the case is yours. We appreciate it. Thank you very much. Mr. Bankston, would you like to call your first witness? Yes, Your Honor. We'd like to call Ovi Carroll to the stand. Carol, would you raise your left hand, please? Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth under the pain and penalty of perjury? I do. You may be seated. By the way, if you all have any questions during this, go ahead and write them down and get them to K. All right? Our bailiff, thank you. So, I'll examine from over here, I, I suppose. Yes. Um, yes, can, can you give your name and your job title, please? My name is Ovi Carroll. I'm a special agent and senior computer forensic examiner for the Office of Special Investigations. Okay. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. Your Honor, I'd like to remind you that a Agent Carroll has been pre-certified as an expert witness in digital media examination and network security practices and principles. No, any objection? No, Your Honor. You may proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, please tell me, Agent Carroll, how were you first involved in this case? I was notified by the OSI headquarters and asked to investigate after they had received a re report from the senator's office that emails and photographs sent by the senator, uh, Senator Gasm, uh, from his laptop computer had been reported in the Washington Con Post and they suspected someone had broken into his computer. Okay. And how did you uh, proceed with your investigation? I immediately went to interview Senator Orgasm and uh, learned that... <laughs> I, I believe that is Senator Gasm. My apologies. Uh, learned that the uh, emails were sent from his laptop computer to his staffer during his attendance at a conference in Las Vegas. The conference was the Society for Morals Under Threat, a uh, smut conference, um, during the period of May 10th through 15th. Uh, again, using the conference's wireless network. And those uh, emails were uh, subsequently appeared in the Washington Compost verbatim. Okay. And what did you do then? Well, after interviewing the senator, I imaged his computer and later conducted a forensic exam. Uh, I found the two emails and the five Im images that were published in the Washington Compost, and I further found that there was uh, no information that suggested that his computer system had been compromised. And what was the next step you took in your investigation? After uh, the interview and the examination, I interviewed the staffer, Kimberly Lovelace, who had received the two emails from the senator uh, with the image attachments. And Ms. Lovelace stated that she did not reveal or share these emails or images with anyone. Okay. Your Honor, at this time, I'd like to introduce into evidence and publish to the jury uh, stipulation regarding Ms. Lovelace's testimony, that being Government Exhibit 13. Do you have any objection? No, Your Honor. The uh, exhibit is hereby entered into evidence and published to the jury. And I'll very briefly point out the relevant bits here. Um, if called as a witness, Kimberly Lovelace would testify 
that she is the communications director for the office of Senator Damon Gasm. She received an email from Senator Gasm on May 12, 2006 at approximately 5 p.m. The email contained an attached picture called sheep underscore defile dot JPEG. This file depicted Senator Gasm and a sheep. Um, <laughs> She received an email from Senator Gasm on May 14, 2006, at approximately 11 a.m. The email contained a zip file attachment. One of the images depicted Senator Gasm wearing her bra and lipstick, and she had sole possession of her laptop and never revealed these emails to anyone, somewhat understandably. <laughs> So after your interview with Ms. Lovelace, uh, what was the next step in your investigation? I imaged and conducted a forensic exam on Ms. Lovelace's laptop computer. Uh, I found that uh, I identified the emails in question that appeared in the Washington Compost. Uh, I identified through the forensic exam that they had been received on that computer through SMTP using the Thunderbird email client. And reviewing the email headers from the two emails, identified the IP address that the email had come from, originated from. Uh, I did a lookup on the IP address and identified that the IP was registered to the Coalition for Moral Order, the CMO conference. Other than that, I found no other information that suggested the system was compromised. Okay, and what did you do next? I went to interview the reporter, Ryan Bullitt, and asked where he got the emails from, and he refused to answer. Okay. Uh, after speaking, after corresponding with the reporter, what did you do? I went to the Senate office building and contacted the system administrators, and they consented to allowing me to image all their network servers and all the senators' staff computers. And what did you conclude from that analysis? Well, I found nothing to suggest that any of the systems had been compromised and, and subsequently began to suspect that the interception of the emails perhaps had occurred on the Coalition for Moral Order conference network. And how did you proceed after reaching that conclusion? Well, I immediately went to the CMO and uh, contacted the conference uh, CISO, the Chief Information Security Officer. Uh, that was Samantha Jones. And she advised there was only one system administrator, and his name was Brian Martin. Um, do you see that person in the courtroom today? I do. It's, he's sitting right over there in the defendant's chair. <laughs> For the record, uh, the witness did identify the defendant. The record so reflects. Thank you, Your Honor. There were very cooperative. The CMO was very cooperative and willing uh, to consent to uh, to allowing us to to search, uh, uh, but they cited company policy requiring us to obtain a search warrant, of which I did. Okay. And once you obtained a search warrant, I uh, went back to the network or to the uh, CISO, uh, contacted her, and then imaged all the uh, servers. Um, found that they had a small network with six uh, Cisco uh, or a small Cisco network with six servers and a small wireless guest network for their conference attendees. Okay. Um, if you could perhaps, actually, where is the evidence binder? Do we have the evidence binder? Anywhere? It's just that imaginary pile to his left. Okay. Could you flip through that imaginary pile, please, oh, um, to tab one? Um, yes. Can you I identify that document, please? That's my forensic report. Okay. Um, Your Honor, we'd like to move into evidence the forensic report, Government Exhibit 1. <laughs> Any objection? Uh, no objection, Your Honor. <laughs> okay. The exhibit has been admitted into evidence. Okay. And what did your examination uh, reveal? Well, I imaged the six servers and examined the switch configuration and began my analysis, and my attention quickly focused on the main network server, a Solaris 9 system. Mm -hmm. and, and your examination of the Solaris 9 system? Well, I reviewed all the system binaries and verified that they had all been, were legitimate system binaries, and they all matched known good binaries uh, and had not been modified or trojanized. How, how did you confirm that they had not been modified or trojanized? Uh, I verified an MD5 checksum on the system with uh, clean known Solaris binaries. Okay. Was there anything else notable from your examination? Well, I examined the root shell history and discovered that someone had logged in as someone who was logged in as root had run a command called moral decency from uh, that was located in the ops local bin directory. Okay. Um, moral decency. Are you familiar with this command? No. 
No, but I did discover that it was a script containing three commands, a snoop, chaos reader, and flesh reader. Okay, I'm a simple country lawyer, so you'll have to step me through this, please. Um, what is snoop? Snoop is a built-in uh, Solaris package sniffer that is run in promiscuous mode. Okay, actually, let's back up and let's go ahead and, uh, let's see, could you flip to tab two, please? And do you recognize that document? I do. And what is that? Uh, that is my results from my exam. Okay. Uh, government moves to, uh, for the admission of Exhibit 2, Government's Exhibit 2. Any objection? And no objection. Publication to the jury. <laughs> can the witness see, can the witness see the slide? Okay. Yes, I can. Um, so, I'm sorry, could you repeat your answer? What is Snoop? Uh, Snoop is a built-in Solaris package sniffer, which was run in That's promiscuous nice. mode. Promiscuous mode. Does, does that mean that uh, the sniffer can see all of the traffic? Well, no, not necessarily. Typically, on a switched network, you can only see traffic destined for your particular computer. But when I examined the switch, I discovered that someone had mirrored the main uplink uh, port spanning all the ports so that they could see all the traffic on the entire network. All the traffic, okay. Um, can you please describe uh, the, 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 the second step in the script? You mentioned chaos reader. Uh, and before, I'm sorry, before you do that, could we, uh, we would move to uh, admit exhibit three, government's exhibit three and publish to the jury? Uh, any objection? Nah, go ahead. <laughs> per, perhaps for the court's edification, you could perhaps describe what exhibit three is and have the witness Certainly. lay some foundation. <laughs> could you please turn to tab three in your imaginary binder <laughs> and uh, identify the next slide. a document? Yes, that's the switch configuration showing that they had mirrored the main uplink port uh, and uh, that they could see by doing that it was routed to a, the, this computer system that could then see all the traffic on the entire network. Okay. And next, could you please flip to tab four in your imaginary binder hmm. and identify that? I think we're going to probably uh, suspend the rules of evidence for a moment. <laughs> um, Chaos reader. Okay. So, uh, can you please describe the third step in the script you described? Um, flesh reader? Uh, well, uh, chaos reader was the second step, but that was the one that takes, uh, and what chaos reader does is it takes all the raw packets from the snoop. Uh, capture and then reassembles the package into their original sessions and then organizes them and dumps them into a directory. And what, then, if, what if anything did you find in the Chaos Reader directory? Uh, well, I actually found hundreds of files, uh, but I focused on the files between the date of May 11th and May 15th. Uh, and in, in addition, I had found uh, the two emails uh, and the five images that match the, the, the images that were published in the newspaper. Okay. Um, could you please look at tab five and please describe the document there? Uh, yes, this... Um, these, uh, I found the two email messages with the MIME encoded attachments, and this just shows that they were in session four and session 13 of the, um, the, the Snoop packets. So, so what I did is I, I decoded the MIME attachments and discovered that the first email had one attachment, and the second one had four attachments that were included in a zip file. Okay. Um, I, I believe now is the time we will take a look at those photos. I would like to warn the jury these may be uh, somewhat disturbing. Um, I believe PETA also has a ongoing litigation. Uh, <laughs> Goodness gracious me, oh my. Uh, but before we, we slap you in the face with these, uh, I'd, I'd like to ask the witness, uh, did you find any indication as to the author of the Flesh Reader program? in the code? I did. It was uh, the system administrator, Brian Martin. I found the source code on the computer system itself, and it had 
his information in it. Thank you. Okay, flipping to exhibit, oh, I'm sorry, uh, tab six. Could you identify? Oof. Uh, one, of, one of the images. Uh, are, are, are you certain? I, I believe it may be one of the emails. Was it the email? Oh, oh, tab six, you said. Ah, oh, gotcha. <laughs> And uh, we would move to admit Exhibit 6 into evidence. Any objection? No, none at all. Admitted into evidence. All right. And so could you please describe what we're looking at here? Uh, this is session four, uh, one of the sessions that contain the, uh, one, the single image and the email. Okay. Uh, could you please, I'm sorry, flip to tab seven. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's um, the that is, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. I was just, I've been in law enforcement 20 years and this, <laughs> I, I'm still having Objection, problems. Objection, Your Honor. He's grandstanding. <laughs> <laughs> Stick to the testimony, sir. Yes. Yes, sir. That's the image. Uh, I would move that Exhibit 7 be uh, admitted. Any objection based on yes. the rules of evidence? <laughs> yes. uh, no, Your Honor. Uh, could you please publish to the I'm journal? I'm dying to see this, so go ahead. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Again, the prosecution apologizes that you have to see this. There are sick bags uh, at your feet if you need them. Um, moving on uh, as quickly as possible to uh, tab seven. Could you please identify the document of tab seven? Oh, that would be the session 13. That was the uh, information that came out of session 13 packet. Okay. May we move this into evidence and publish to the jury, Your Honor? Uh, I assume you're referring to Exhibit 8. Oh, yes, Your Honor. <laughs> Any objection? If it gets that photo off the screen, Your Honor, right. we would like you to do that, please. It's admitted into evidence. It's okay. And could you please describe what we're looking at here? Uh, this is the text of the email that I found. Okay. And uh, could you please look at tabs 9, 10, 11, and 12, and please <coughs> let me know what those are. Those are the, uh, those are the images that were, were attached to the, uh, ooh, the, those are all the images that were attached to the, to the email. Thank you. We'd like to move 9 through 12 uh, into evidence and publish to the church. No objection, Your Honor. One no. Just one no. <laughs> <laughs> That's enough, thank you. So Agent Carroll, <coughs> do you have any idea um, who ran this program that collected these email, uh, emails and, and, and photos? Well, um, Snoop would need to be run with administrator privileges, so someone with uh, root access. Okay. Um, could you verify how administrative access to the machine was defined? Well, I, uh, I reviewed the system, the, the Etsy default login file, and determined that uh, root could only log in from the local console. Could an administrator gain root uh, access using other methods? Well, the, uh, the administrator could gain root access using other methods, like uh, he could log on as himself and then SU to root. SU to root. Yes. Um, again, a simple country lawyer, but I'll, I'll let that pass. Uh, can you determine who SU'd? Uh, to root? Well, uh, after examining the var log SU log file, uh, I determined that, that the only person that ever SU'd to root uh, was, the per was a person using Brian Martin's login. Okay, thank you. No further questions. Do you have any uh, questions, Mr. Rohn? I do, Your Honor. Afternoon, Agent Carroll, how are you? Very well, thank you. If you could turn back a page in the thing that's not a script in front of you, mm -hmm. um, I'd like to cover a question. Um, so you talked about Snoop, oh, okay, and you talked about Chaos Reader, mm -hmm. but there was this third thing, Flesh Reader. Yes. 
So could you describe what did Flesh Reader do? Uh, Flesh Reader is a homegrown program that uh, uh, I found the binary and then the subsequent source code. And what it does is it scans a directory of Chaos Reader uh, dumps and, and then looks at the files and any of the images and does a color gradient analysis. And if it determines that an image has a certain range of colors, it flags it as pornography and then saves it in the Chaos Reader file. If it doesn't, it deletes the session file. Okay, thank you. Um, now, let me just make sure I, I, you know, I understand the forensic process that you went through here. So the first thing you do is you drive up, you kick down the door, presumably, barge into the server room, and you turn off all the machines. Is that correct? No, no, of course not. Oh, so what do you do then? Well, we collected volatile data first before okay, we shut the system and, down. And what do you mean volatile data? Could you explain to the jury? Well, this would be capturing all the data that runs in memory. Okay, and then could you just briefly describe the commands you ran? And in particular, I'd turn your attention to page 23 of Government's Exhibit 1, which had previously been uh, admitted to the evidence. Your Honor, I'd like to publish page 23 to the jury. It has been done. Okay, thank you. <laughs> That's pretty quick. Um, so, if I understand this correctly, volatile memory reflects the data that was in memory as opposed to what was on the disk. Correct. And it's possible, in your expert opinion, that there was something in volatile memory that wasn't on the disk. Is that correct? Well, it's, it's possible. That's, that's fine. Thank you. Um, and you checked the disk, correct, for Trojans and backdoors. I, I believe that was your testimony. Is, is that correct? That's correct. So is it possible that there could have been a Trojan hidden in volatile memory? Well, it, it is possible, but again, I didn't find anything that, that suggested That's fine. That. Thank you for your answer. Um, and then let's talk again about this directory you found uh, that allegedly had the, the email and the pictures of the senator. You said that the way Flesh Reader and Chaos Reader interact, there were lots of files in this directory. Were there other image files in this directory? Uh, as I stated, a hundred or so, yes. Okay, were there, did you look at any of these other image files? Did I you did. open them up? I did. Did you look at all of them? I did. Were there any other images of people depicted in any of those files? Yes. And how would you say those people were dressed in the pictures that you were looking at? Less than conference attire. <laughs> Specifically, what do you mean? What were they wearing? Uh, less than beach attire. Okay. <laughs> would, would you say that there were some pictures in there of people without any clothes on at all? Uh, yes, there were. And would you say that there were pictures that you may define in your expert opinion as pornography in that directory? Sure. Okay, thank you. Uh, last, last set of questions for you. Did you obtain any phone records for my client, Brian Martin? I did. Did you obtain his home phone records? I obtained his home phone records, cell phone, and work phone records. Okay, and any of those three sets of phone records, did you find any phone calls from my client to the reporter, Ryan Bulat, in the range of time that we're describing? I did not on those phone records. Okay, and what about email records? Did you obtain, through whatever process, the email records from my client, Brian Martin? I did, both home and work. And again, same question, in any of those records, did you find any e evidence of email messages being sent from Brian Martin to Ryan Bulat? Well, no, not on those. <laughs> okay, thank you. No further questions, Your Honor. Any redirect? Just a couple, Your Honor. Um, Agent Carroll, uh, in your expert opinion, are there any methods by which a system administrator could send emails that are untraceable or otherwise would not identify the sender as the system administrator? Absolutely. Any, any system administrator could easily do it. Okay. And quickly, regarding the directory of photographs, you mentioned people in less than convention attire and perhaps their birthday suits. Were there any people who were not in a state of undress in that directory and or were there any photos that were not of people? Yes. As a matter of fact, there were photos of sand dunes, there were photos of uh, full face photos, uh, kids in bathing suits, there were a number of photos that uh, matched the color gradient, I guess. Okay. Thank you. That'll be all. Any additional questions on the defense? No, Your Honor. May we excuse the witness? Yes, Your Honor. Uh, the witness is excused. Thank you for your testimony. Mr. Bankston, do you have any additional witnesses? Yes, Your Honor. At this time, we would like to call Senator Damon Gazzam, please. Your Honor, if you would, uh, uh, humorous here, if you'd raise your left hand, please. <laughs> you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth under the pain and penalty of perjury? 
So help me God. Please have a seat. <laughs> Good afternoon, and thank you for being here. Could you please state your name and your occupation? Uh, yes, my name has been pronounced uh, horribly during this. Uh, and I want to correct that. It's actually a uh, Creole, French Creole name. It's not pronounced gasm, which is somewhat offensive. It is jism. That's how it's pronounced. My name is Senator Damon Jism. I am a four-term senator from the uh, great state of Texas. Well, I'm from southern Louisiana. I haven't heard that name before. Um, are you familiar with the organization, the Coalition for Moral Order? Yes, I am. I've uh, been behind them uh, ever since they formed 10 years ago, approximately 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, did you attend uh, the Coalition for Moral Order, or, uh, pardon me, the Coalition for Moral Order's SMUT conference in 2006? If you're referring to the Society's Morals Under Threat conference, yes, then yes, yes I did. That's actually, we pronounce it SMUT, <laughs> is how we pronounce it. I see, that. I see. I'm, I'm so sorry. Smut would be offensive. <laughs> pardon, pardon me, Senator. Um, I wanted to see if you, you, you recognize a, a few of the exhibits that have been admitted to in, in evidence. Um, could we show exhibit six, please? Do we have to show? Uh, I'm afraid we do need you to authenticate these. Please show exhibit six. <sighs> okay. And, whoop. Can you identify this? Uh, yes, I can identify that. And what is that? Uh, that is an email that I sent from the conference. Okay, moving on to Exhibit 7. Senator? Yes? Uh, can, can you identify uh, Exhibit 7? I, I realize this may be very embarrassing for you, but it, it must be done. Yeah, I recognize that. That's a picture that I sent with the, uh, the email. Okay. Exhibit seven, please. I mean, eight. And uh, this right here? Yes, that would be the uh, second email that I sent from the conference. Okay. Uh, I won't make you read that. Could we move on to exhibit nine? Do you recognize this photograph? Yes. And could you describe it to me? <laughs> It's a photograph of myself wearing my uh, uh, staff member's bra. Where's your wife, Senator? <laughs> it's okay, Brian. Where's the wife? It's, it's okay, Brian. You Control your chance. client, Mr. Rome. I'm sorry about that, Your Honor. Um, <laughs> and did, did this photograph accompany the email in exhibit? Yes, yes, it did. Yes, it did. Okay. Moving on to exhibit 10. <laughs> Variation on a theme. Uh, Senator. Do you recognize this photograph? Yes. And was this also attached to the... Yes. Yes. Um, one more, I believe? Two more, actually? Oh, just one more. Thank goodness. Uh, do you recognize this? Yes. Yes, I recognize that one. It was uh, attached to the email. Yes, yes, yes. We all know. We all saw the pictures. Okay. We all had a really good laugh. So, and, and, and to, to be clear, when and where uh, did you... When and, when and from where did you send these emails uh, with these... Could we, could we really? Could we take that off the screen? It's <laughs> highly embarrassing. Yes, yes, I believe Please. we can. <laughs> <laughs> can we take that one? Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, I sent the uh, I sent the emails and the pictures from the conference from from the Smoot conference. Um, whose network were you using? Well, the hotel where we were having. Uh, the uh, conference did not have internet access, so I was using the conference supplied wireless network. The, the network supplied by the conference organizers? Yes, the, that's the that's Coalition the for Moral Order. C correct. Okay. Uh, did the Coalition for Moral Order provide you with any terms of service or acceptable use policy that put you on notice that you might, that your communications may be monitored? Well, no. Was there any announcement during the orientation regarding monitoring of the network? No, no, not at all. I was, I was you know, I, I've, I've spoken to my esteemed colleague, uh, Senator uh, Ted Stevens uh, from Alaska, and he's explained to me how this is all put together using pipes, and it was my understanding that, that 
I had my own private pipe that no one could look at. And so I thought, well, it's my pipe, no one can see it, and this is, this is, this pipe is for jism. that's what it's for, that's for, it's for me. One moment. <laughs> um, thank you. Uh, uh, Senator Jism. Um, Jism. 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 I'm, I'm it's, a, so it's, a, it's a soft, soft J. <laughs> did, 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 were you in any way notified that the network may be monitored? No. Did you consent in any way of, to of having your communications not. monitored? No, no, of course okay. not. Of course As not. to the emails and photographs that you just identified, uh, did you send those to anyone other than your staffer? Oh, Kimberly of course Lovelace? not. No, 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 of course not. Have course you not. shared those files with anyone in any other way? No, not at all. Okay. Um, has any, did anyone have access to your laptop in the time between when you sent those emails and when they were reprinted in the Washington Compost. No, I actually kept my laptop with me at all times, and even when I was asleep, I kept my laptop under my pillow. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> moving into a more personal area, uh, how has the disclosure of these uh, photos and emails, the publication of these in the Washington Compost, affected your, your life, whether personally or professionally? Personally and professionally, it's affected me both ways, both personally and professionally. I mean, right now, I'm, uh, it, it's been terrible. I'm now going through my second divorce, uh, uh, thanks to all this coming out. Um, uh, in that, I'm gonna have to you know, sell, sell the, you know, the house in the Hamptons. I'm gonna have to sell the house back in Texas. I'm going to have to sell my the yacht, my proud yacht that I'm so proud of, the uh, the SS Abramoff. That 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 has to go because I've got to sell that. I mean, it's just it's been terrible. And of course, you know, we're coming up on midterms, and things are looking rough for us. And so, you know, it looks like I may actually lose the election. And 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 uh, there'll be some. Democrat taking my place in the, in the Senate. I just, I just, it's terrible. It's been completely awful. And I've my membership to the uh, country club is uh, country club has been revoked. And uh, the uh, the the CMO they uh, uh, they said that I can't attend the next uh, 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 Smoot conference. We have a very large conference coming up in in January in Washington D.C. Uh, a a Smoot, uh, Smoot conference. We I, I, we usually use the French pronunciation of that as well, which is Shmu. So I'm not going to be able to attend ShmooCon in Washington uh, uh, in, uh, in January at all. Okay. Thank you. I know this was very difficult, but I have no further questions. Yes. Do you have any cross examination? Yes, well? Your Honor. So, Senator Gazim. Um, Jism. That's right, Senator Gazim. Jism. Right, the Senator Gazim. Um, <laughs> you've always been known as kind of a values first senator, isn't that true? Yes, yes. And so that's why this is so embarrassing to you, isn't it? This really does fundamentally strike the image that you've been so carefully trying to craft. Oh, well, yeah, it's extremely embarrassing. Right. It's extremely embarrassing. And, and let's talk a little bit about, about the CMO that we've heard so much about. Um, what are the values of this organization as you understand it? Well, the values of it is to promote the family. Of course, the families first, protect the children, and you know, to, to make sure that our society is living by you know, a moral and, and decent conduct. So in that way, you would say that, that your values that you've at least professed and their values are, are usually pretty compatible with one another. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. And so has this affected your relationship with the coalition at all? Yes. As, I, as I've stated, I'm not going to be able to attend uh, ShmooCon. And uh, there's, uh, they've actually, I was on their advisory board. I'm not allowed to attend meetings or correspond with any of the... Uh, Current members. And then one more time, just to just to clarify, it was this, the fact that you sent these email messages while at the conference that has caused you all this difficulty with yes. you, your values, yes. 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 coalition, and your constituency. Yes. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. Thank you. No further questions. 
there any uh, redirect? No, Your Honor. I'm ready to move on to the next witness. Will you excuse the witness? Uh, Senator, thank you for your time. And have a good trip back to Texas. Thanks, Rick. <laughs> Your Honor, at this time, we'd like to call Ryan Bulot to uh, the stand. You raise your left hand. Will you tell us the truth? <laughs> Good afternoon. Could you give your, your name and occupation, please? Yes, I am uh, Ryan Bulat. I have been a writer for the Washington Compost for three years. I report on the hot topics in the D.C. area. Hot topics, I see. Could you turn to tab 15 in the imaginary binder, please? Uh, can you tell me what that is? Yes, that is the... Uh, the article I wrote on uh, May 19th, 2005, about Senator Gasm. Your Honor, we'd like to move that into I'm evidence sorry, isn't, isn't. and publish to, to the jury. Any objection to the admission of Exhibit 15? No objection, Your Honor. Um, Mr. Bulot, could you read the article for the jury? And please do include the emails that are in the story because I did not want to require Senator Gism to, to, to read them. I'm sorry, I cannot read that from here. <laughs> <laughs> Your Honor, could the witness have leave to approach the Ejection. projector? No, There's no objection. <laughs> Perhaps you can use counsel's mic. Yeah, you can, that's attached. You can. <laughs> Exclusive. Senator Gasm's slip is showing, and a lot more. The senator, known as Values First, uh, known for his Values First platform and sponsorship of the campaign for moral order, apparently let his hair down behind doors. In exclusive emails and photos received by this reporter, the married senator was revealed to be having kinky sex with a staffer and a sheep. <laughs> the staff member, 19-year-old Kimberly Lovelace, is the communications director for the office of Senator Damon Gasm and confirmed receiving the emails from the senator while he was attending the Society's Morals Under Threat conference, sponsored by the Coalition for Moral Order. Several of the images, which are too inappropriate for a family newspaper, revealed the senator in a cross-dressing romp with Miss Lovelace. The unedited content of one of the emails is follows. I have been thinking of you. See what happens when you are not around, a semicolon. Close parentheses. <laughs> Were there any pictures published with this news story? I'm sorry, repeat the question. Were there any pictures published with this news story? No, this is a family newspaper. We could not reveal such images. I see. Okay. Um, Mr. Bulot, are you acquainted with the defendant, Brian Martin? Yes, he is an acquaintance of mine. Uh, how are you acquainted with him? Well, he has been a fan of my writing for some time, and we exchanged a few emails regarding some of my writing. Mm -hmm. And how did you receive the emails that were printed in your story? Uh, from an anonymous source. Um, a source sent them to you? Yes, yes. By email, I suppose? Yes, by email. <clears throat> did the defendant send you these emails? An anonymous source sent me these emails. No, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Did the defendant, yes or no, send you the emails that were published in this story? Uh, I have been directed by my counsel at the Electronics Frontier Foundation to... Bastards. <laughs> ...to uh, not answer this question. Your Honor, could you please direct the witness to answer the question? Uh, sir, is that your final response to the direct question to you from the prosecutor? Yes, I invoke my First Amendment journalist right. All right. Your Honor, this is absolutely beyond the pale, this journalist wrapping himself in the First Amendment. Uh, uh, could you please hold him in contempt, Your Honor? Uh, Mr. Bankston, we've been through this. Uh, we'll now turn the mics off so the jury doesn't have to hear this. <laughs> we have a previously established process for this. There's another forum for dealing with this. We'll proceed in that forum. Uh, do you have any more questions for the journalist? One. One, Your Honor. Do you deny that the defendant provided you with the emails that were published in your story? I refuse to answer this question. <laughs> Sir, we will now uh, 
Well, let me ask, Mr. Ohm, do you have any questions? Uh, just some quick questions, Your Honor. I'll ask him from here. Uh, Mr. Bielan, how, hi, how are you? Oh, I'm fine. <laughs> Great. Um, have you ever met my client, Brian Martin, in person? Not before today, no. So this is the first time you've ever seen this man, Brian Martin? Yes. Okay. Thank you. No further questions, Your Honor. Uh, any redirect? No, Your Honor, we're done. All right. uh, thank we'll... you, Mr. Bulat. You are dismissed from this particular proceeding. Thank you. Mr. Bankston, do you have any additional witnesses? No, Your Honor. Prosecution rests. All right. Defense? Okay. Um, yeah, the defense would call John Klein to the stand, please. Raise your left hand. Do you promise to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth under the pains and penalties of perjury? I suppose if I have to. You do, sir. Please be seated. Mr. Klein, afternoon. Afternoon, sir. Could you please state your name and your occupation for the record? Yes. Uh, Jonathan Klein, Director of Security Solutions, Kalins, LLC. And, uh, Your Honor, I will remind you that we've prior stipulated this uh, Mr. Klein as an expert witness. So noted. Thank you. Did you perform an examination of the Solaris 9 machine? Uh, yes, I did. Uh, forensics exam on the disk and uh, on the uh, volatile memory. And if you turn a tab 73 times pi, um, <laughs> do you recognize this document? Yes, that's my forensics report. Okay. Um, and, Your Honor, I would move that into evidence. Fine. Uh, any objection? No, Your Honor. Okay, now, Mr. Klein, could you please tell the jury what it is you found on the Solaris 9 machine? Um, I found evidence that a hacker had installed a back door on the system. But, okay, and the then... Objection, Your Honor! This is wholly irrelevant, and this is far beyond the scope of the expert disclosures. This was not reflected in the report that we were providing. All right, all right, one, one moment. Uh, let's not have any speaking objections uh, in front of the jury. Uh, I think we knew this was going to happen. Uh, I think we're going to ask the jury to step out of the room for a moment. Uh, and we will have a sidebar on this. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm sorry. Uh, this happens sometimes. It's between the lawyers and the judge. Uh, and the bailiff has now removed the jury. So please uh, step forward. Someone's actually leaving. Mr. Bankson, would you state your objection, please? Your Honor, the forensics report that we were provided in a timely manner includes nothing about any kind of backdoor from any hacker. All we have are uh, supplements to the report that were provided to us only this morning, which we haven't even had time to review. This is wholly prejudicial and far outside the scope of his expert disclosures. Mr. O? Your Honor, now that the jury is out of our presence, may I offer that we present a proffer of the evidence that we're going to present, and I think you'll see that it's well within the scope of our timely well, disclosures. Let me ask you this. Have you made uh, any disclosures on the defense expert? Absolutely. So uh, we timely complied with the rules, and we, within the time limits specified there, turned over the exhibit with the expert report, and we supplemented those 24 hours ago. Uh, 24 hours ago you supplemented? Yes, but it was just an expansion of what we had said in our earlier report. All right. Do, do you have any objection to my hearing what the uh, expert would, would testify to if would be allowed? Of course not, Your Honor. All right. I'd like to hear that uh, so you can uh, somewhat dispense with the rules of evidence okay. here. I'd like to understand through your witness what it is you would have the jury hear. Great. Thank you. Uh, so, Mr. Klein, because the jury is no longer in the room, um, I'm going to have you speak to the judge um, and let him know what you would testify to uh, if we're permitted to present this testimony. So what did you Very find well. on that Solaris 9 machine? So uh, the first thing I started looking at was the volatile data collected by Special Agent Carroll. Um, I'd like to request uh, Defense Exhibit 1, please. Yeah, and uh, we're no longer moving into evidence, but if we could present yeah, Exhibit like 1. I'd like to see de de uh, Defense Exhibit 1. Uh. So this is the output from an NMAP uh, run from another machine against the Solaris 9 machine that, that Agent Carroll had run. And in this particular case, it's looking at TCP connections from ports 1 to 65,535. We're looking for anything that is going to be opened or is answering. Well, as a federal judge, I'm very familiar with NMAP. <laughs> <laughs> so in other words, Your Honor, what we're looking for is everything that this computer is listening to with respect to an outside connection. Okay, and then what did you do next? So if, please go to Defensive Exhibit 2. So the first thing I started to do was eliminate all the ports that I would know about. So in this instance, I ran a netstat command, and I grepped for anything being listened on. 
So these are all of the ports with which a process is listening for a connection from the outside. I was able to cross-reference all of these ports against known services in the INET Superdemon or within standalone services. And again, so just to clarify, I identify. and to clarify, this, you weren't running these live commands on a machine. This is this was the output of what by Agent Special Carol Agent Carroll. Okay. Yes, thank you. And what'd you do next? So next, I uh, ask that you go to Defense Exhibit Three, please. So in this case, now I, I looked at the re remote procedure calls. Uh, these are registered programs on the machine using the port mapper uh, associated with Solaris. So these are services that are registered in a different mechanism than the INET Superdemon. And I correlated all of the ports that were being listened to based on RPC and removed them from the list. And next, what did you do next? Well, so that left me with port 33003 as the only port I couldn't account for. Okay, and so how'd you proceed from there? So I looked through the system to see if I can find any reference to port 3303, and if the clerk would please move to Defense Exhibit 4. I was able to find that 33003 was defined in Etsy services as a registered service called DBServe. Okay, and what'd you do next? Well, so at this point, I wanted to look at all open file descriptors on the system to see if I could figure out what was associated with 33003. So using the data collected by Agent Carroll, I, I looked at the LSOF data, and that would be De Defense Exhibit 5. Okay. So as you can see in Defense Exhibit 5, there is a connection being listened on on DBServe, which translates to 33003. The name of the program is SQL data, and the process ID is 1883. So what that tells me is there is a program running on the system called SQL data, and at the time the system was running, it had a process ID of 1883. Uh, if the clerk would please move to Defense Exhibit 6. This is additional LSOF data, and what I found interesting was that some of the libraries being used by SQL data involved network programs. And I find that kind of strange for an SQL data program. In fact, I found the whole idea of an SQL data program to be kind of strange. To me, that seems like it should be a, a data file, not a program. So what did you do to investigate this idea you had? Well, so I started getting very suspicious. So the first thing I wanted to do was I wanted to find this SQL data. So if we could please move to Defense Exhibit, I'm sorry, yeah, we want to move to Defense Exhibit 7. I want to see what Process 1883 is. Now what really struck me funny is if you will look at the bottom of the slide, port, uh, process ID 1883 is user sbin vald, which in Solaris is the Solaris volume manager. It, it handles all requests for uh, removable media to be mounted and <coughs> unmounted from the system. So again, I found this rather strange since I was looking for a program called SQL data and it was calling itself user sbin vald. That, that is not normal. Okay, and so what'd you do? To this so now, now I'm really getting suspicious. I, I want to find this file. So if we can move to Defense Exhibit 8, I use the find command to search through the entire system looking for any reference to SQL data. So at the top of the exhibit, you'll notice the find command grepping for SQL data, and I found one instance, opt local SQL SQL data. I proceeded to do a, what's called a long listing on that command to determine what its permissions were. And if you will notice, it's read, write, read, read. The interesting thing about this is that for a program to execute on the system, it must have execute permission. And if you'll notice, execute permission is missing off that file. Okay. I further looked in, in this directory by doing a, a long listing and looking for every file in that directory. I found an additional file, SQL clean, which is a, um, an executable program. You'll notice at the bottom, I did an ls minus a at. Now, in Solaris 9, the concept of a extended file attribute was added, similar to what Microsoft uses as extended attributes on Microsoft systems. And if you will notice in the first line, uh, after the end of the directory entry, there is an at sign. What that indicated to me was there was an extended attribute associated with that directory. Okay. Now the one problem with trying to find this is that the tools looking for extended attributes don't run consistently in a Solaris system. 
So if you're not careful, it's very easy to miss this. But as a, such a qualified expert, you were careful, I imagine. I, I was very careful Thank with you. this, yes. yes. Okay. So I have some very strange circumstances here where I have uh, the SQL data that's not really a program and I have an extended attribute on the directory. Uh, I decided I needed to start digging further. Okay, and so how did you do that? So I started looking through the system, looking for anything, any file associated with SQL data. And through my examination, I found a cron job referencing SQL data. If the clerk would please move to Defense Exhibit 9. If you will notice at the bottom, it's a, this is an entry of a, for a cron job, which says run every hour opt local SQL SQL clean slash opt local SQL SQL data. What did this tell you? Well, what, what it looked like to me was that every hour this SQL data file in this SQL directory was being cleaned, maybe old data that needed to be compressed out. Um, looked fairly innocuous. Uh, I, I would say anybody looking at it would say, there's nothing wrong with this, but since I saw the extended attribute on the SQL directory, I decided to examine it further. Okay. So, I'm, I'm sorry. Go ahead, how did you do that? So, I got suspicious of the SQL clean binary. So, if we could please move uh, to Defense Exhibit 10. So, within the Solaris system, or, or sorry, within Sun Microsystems, Sun Microsystems maintains what's called a Solaris fingerprint database. And what they do is they maintain an MD5 checksum of every binary issued with every Solaris system, I believe starting with Solaris 8, so that an administrator or an investigator could look at a binary and tell exactly what that binary was. So I decided that I want to um, send up SQL clean to see what it was, see if it showed up anywhere in the Sun Fingerprint database. So the way to do that is you collect the MD5 checksum off of the, of the file, and then you run this sfpc.pl script provided by Sun Microsystems to submit that MD5 checksum to, uh, to the database. And what did you discover from the database? So as you can see from the return on the database, our friendly program SQL Clean is actually a Solaris binary user bin run at. And what does run at do? So if we please move to Defense Exhibit 11. What RunAt does is it allows the capability, it gives you the capability of being able to manipulate the extended attribute space. So for example, I use the RunAt command, I can copy things into the attribute space, I could list it, I could change the mode of a file, I could change the ownership of a file, um, and it's all hidden within that attribute space. So I found it very interesting that the RunAt command was, was being used in this situation. So now if we go back to uh, Defense Exhibit uh, 9. So if you now look at this cron job, what I'm really doing is a user bin run at on directory opt local SQL, and now I'm manipulating a, a file called SQL data. So moving to Defense Exhibit 12, I indeed issued the run at command on that directory and looked at what was in there, and as you can see, what SQL data is, is, an, is a binary, set user ID to root, which means this will execute as a super user every time it runs. So every hour, this program is being executed on the system. Okay, and so what did you do next? Well, so... Per, per, perhaps we could, uh, this has made me rather thirsty. Uh, <laughs> per, perhaps we could take a break, uh, 10 minute break? 10, ten minutes. A 10 minute break. Uh, and I'll wet my whistle and we'll resume with the sidebar discussion. Okay, thank you. So we'll be back in 10 minutes.